Hi everyone, episode two of Wigan Fan TV. Thank you to everybody uh, that tuned in on Friday night. Um, I guess the reaction has probably pulled us back online tonight. Uh, we're up to 14,000 views um, on the first video, which is probably 13,999 more views, more than, than what we expected to, to get. Uh, I'm joined tonight by Mark. Um, many of you may not recognise Mark, but you might recognise the voice of Mark when he starts talking in just a second. If anybody tunes in uh, to Super League Pod, uh, which is a fantastic podcast um, that you can listen to during the Super League season, and we'll talk to Mark in, in just a second about the Super League Pod and, and his thoughts on the season. Um, just to sort of answer a few questions that are perhaps arising from Friday night's broadcast, what, we, what we're trying to do with this is basically bring as many fans in into this arena as possible. Uh, I think we're up to maybe 14, 15 people that are looking to contribute. Matt's on Friday night, Mark tonight. We can get three, four people on screen at a time. So if you are still interested, the website's on the screen at the moment, WiganRugbyFans.com. Just go on there. You can send, you'll see the link on there. Just send me an email. We'll get you on. We'll get you scheduled. We want this to be an inclusive community. We want people with a variety of... Uh, opinions and comments and all things rugby league and all things Wigan to to get involved. Um, on there you'll see uh, Wigan's fan forum, which has moved this year. So rlfans.com, that's your access point now for the uh, for the fans forum. Uh, there's a cheeky little shop on there if you want to buy any uh, shirts for your new South Wales tour and uh, things like that. But have a look. Um, but welcome, Mark. Thank you for joining us to the second ever edition of which I'm still calling a trial. Um, but thank you very much for, for joining us tonight. Mark, can you start with um, maybe just explaining what it is that you do on a regular basis with Super League Pod and, and maybe how people can, can listen to Super League Pod? Yeah, hi, Sean. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, Super League Pod, it's a weekly podcast that runs throughout the season. Um, so we're starting up in a couple of weeks with our preview show. Uh, it's me and my friend Tom do do that podcast. We've got we cover the whole league, so we've got listeners from all the different teams throughout all the leagues, really. From you know, we've got listeners from all over the world, which is uh, you know, you were saying you're blown away with the reaction you've had to your first video. Yeah. Like when we get emails in from people who are in, I don't know, San Francisco, and then one guy from Dubai, and then loads of guys from down under and stuff. It's it's really great, and uh, we've got a, a really good community like what you're trying to build. Um, and yeah, so basically, me and Tom go through the news and the uh, matches each each week and share everyone else's views on, on them from across, you know, all the fan bases, really. Yeah. I mean, I think probably the, the obviously the, the, the beauty of a podcast is you can pretty much download and listen at any point. So there's, you know, anybody that might download the podcast from iTunes, you can get Super League Pod from iTunes. Yeah, Spreaker. you can search for us on, on iTunes. Um, Spreaker.com forward slash Super League Pod is kind of like, where it's hosted from, um, you can put it into all your different, you know, podcast devices from there. But also, there's there's the League Cast app. I don't know if you're aware of that. The, the it's okay. an Android app. So if you're not a Apple user, there's a there's an app you can find in your Google Play uh, that's called League Cast, and that has all the rugby league podcasts in one place, basically. Perfect. And uh, you know, we're one of the people on there, so that's a good place to listen to us too. You can check us out at, at Super League Pod on Twitter. Is probably the first stop for most people and then find out more about us from there yeah i guess um i mean that, that's probably the easiest place i've just popped that on the screen now um mark you probably can't see that but i'll just pop your uh twitter page ju just on the screen uh, at the moment for anybody that is looking for you super at super league pod that's what the logo looks like super league with headphones either side um but definitely give give mark and the guys a listen during the season i think one of the things yeah, that, that will come um, across that, sorry go on, mark. that that fit, that post tag to the top just to do a little bit of a plug we're taking everyone's predictions at the moment for the season ahead so we're going to talk about some of them now and we're going to maybe talk about some of our wigan based predictions aren't we but um for everyone to get in touch with their predictions if you go to our page now pinned to the top is a form you can fill in with all your predictions for the season so get on that everyone who's following along Excellent. We've put that, I'll put that back on the screen for you. Yeah. I mean, we are tonight very much going to be looking at this, I guess, with cherry and white tinted glasses on. 
the aim of Super League pod is perhaps to widen that scope a little bit, whereas we are very much going to be Wigan based, and, and that's obviously what you specialise in, Mark, being a Wigan fan. <laughs> um, but you know, you, you've got to let the other eleven teams at some point as well, I guess, on Super League pod. Yeah, we give everyone fair coverage. Not yeah, that anyone yeah. agrees with me on that. <laughs> um, so tonight we're, we're going to crack on. Um, like the other night, uh, if anybody's got any questions that they want to put to Mark or they want to put to myself, just put them in the comments section on Facebook, send them through, we can bring those on screen. You might take us off on a bit of a tangent, but that's not a problem. We'll try and answer them. If there's any more questions about my beard, I can't answer those. Um, there might be some questions, Mark, about your glasses and where you got them from. We had those the other night. We may possibly ignore ignore those tonight. But if there's any rugby really rugby league or Wigan related questions, send them through. Uh, neither of us are experts; we're just fans like yourselves watching. But we'll put our opinion on it and our spin on it. We don't work for the club; we don't have any inside knowledge. Um, which I no think one pays us for this. Nobody sure. pays us for this. We, we just I, I, this is our hobby. Um, I think people were looking for some inside information the other night, which uh, which me and Matt definitely didn't have. But I'll, I'll open up, uh, Mark, by sending sort of the same question over to you that I sent to to Matt the other night. Is very much a case of it's a very broad question, and I think it's the biggest question and the biggest perhaps cloud that is over Wigan, if that's the right um, turn of phrase, before the start of the 2018 season. Is is a lineup? How how on earth are Wigan going to line up? Like I said well, to Matt the other night, it, it's you know there's certain positions that are that are nailed on, but give me your take on. You know the key position, the spine of the squad, the fullback half. It's one six seven okay. and nine, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Well, hopefully we're going to see a fully fit Morgan Escaro back and playing in the kind of form he played in last year, and that would allow us to put Tompkins in the in the halves. I think Williams, as great a player as he is, and as much as I love watching what he can do on a rugby pitch, he's got a big weakness. I feel, and that's reading the play of the game. You know from a, not spotting where there's an opening and that sort of stuff is very instinctive, but he doesn't yeah. necessarily read where the defenders are lining up. Sam Tompkins is a good communicator. He's someone who understands the game completely. Putting him next to him in the half and talking to him throughout the game, I think that that will help in that game. Plus, Tom, Tompkins has got a great kicking game, something that I don't think we got as much of out of our halfbacks last year as we as we might have done. Um, so, so I think Escaray, Tompkins and, and Williams would be my... One six seven to start the season, yeah. um, and and I really like Sam Powell, so I'm happy with him being our our nine with uh, I guess Lulu I off the bench to spell him. I mean, I think w- when I spoke to Matt the other night, he was very much w- when we discussed this. I think that's the populist view. I think that's what a lot of people would would say. Now Matt's view on that was he can see, and and I think this is a good point. Maybe Sam Powell going to to six or seven with Williams. Um, my the, the sort of thing that I threw out there, and I'll throw this at you as well, uh, Mark. Is my concern is Sam Tompkins defending at six or seven? Do you think you? Yeah, I mean he's going to be exposed to big bodies a lot of, a lot more often than perhaps what he is to at one. I mean, is that a concern for you? Maybe having? I mean, Williams is a fantastic defender. There's no there's no question marks about him. But maybe Tompkins in that line. Well, if you look at um, the one game that <laughs> there's a question come off out of the bookshelves. Uh, there's I've got I don't know one of my favourite is there's a lot of rugby league books up behind me. Gareth Hawke's autobiography was a uh, was an enlightening read. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the defence. I mean, Leeds have always really done a good job to hide Borough and Maguire over the last fifteen years in yeah, defence. I don't see why we can't find a way to hide him from the bigger blokes. That Le- like Leeds have always managed to do, um, and I actually think he's probably a bit tougher than we give him credit for, because we're we're so used to watching him not return the ball, try and get out of the way of men, try and preserve himself physically. But, yeah. Like I think back to, do you remember the semi final in 2016 of the of the Challenge Cup at Doncaster, when Gareth Ellis basically tried to run over him and he stopped him on the goal Do you know line. why? Do you know and why I, think, I remember you know, that? Yeah, he can. Just go to sort on. of go off on a tangent. I remember that game because it was the night before my wedding, and I had to watch it oh, with a wow. whole fan. Uh, so yeah, that, yes, I do remember it, Mark, and I just got over it. Thanks for bringing it up. But go on, carry on. The, the night before my wedding was the um, 
was the Leeds Wigan helicopter in the air, which where's the yeah. League Leader Shield going to go to? Game? <laughs> so yeah, maybe we have to have like a little bit of an upset before we have the happiest days. But um, no, so go. I think I think there's a you know we can do that job. The thing as well with Sam Powell, the one game he played in the half last year really was Castleford away. And I actually think that was the worst I've ever seen him defend in the last two years. So I'm not yeah. sure if him defending his face is as good as him defending down the middle, where he doesn't miss a tackle. Yeah, and I think I think the problem perhaps with um, you know, not and, and I know that Matt will be watching this uh, at some point, whether he's watching live or not. I'm not too sure, and I'm sure he'll let us know if he is. Not not to sort of pick holes in, in Matt's suggestion of, of putting Sam Powell at, at number seven. I just think that Sam Powell has developed into a player that Wigan fans probably, we don't appreciate too much at this moment in time playing at nine. But if he was to get injured and if he was to disappear, I think we would start to miss him a lot more than perhaps we, we realise. I think he's he doesn't do things that are exceptional at nine, but he does things right. And I think he's developed it's like, himself. Um, it's like you say with that, like McLaurin, we always remember the big hits, but... What sticks in mind for me last year is that missed tackle he did on Kyle Amor that set up the Percival try away at Saints when we were better than them for 78 minutes and then yeah. or 70 minutes and then they, they, they capitalised on a few mistakes and it was always those missed tackles. Powell doesn't miss tackles. He's the second man in all the time, wraps up the ball, doesn't let anything happen. But people don't notice that because it doesn't look yeah. spectacular. Yeah. So, and he doesn't run out of dummy half, but neither, you know, no one has for Wigan since, what, Mickey Iron maybe... 10 years yeah. ago. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, I think that's that's the thing is it, the, hooker is a, a difficult position to actually catch the eye in unless you're doing things like that. If you're Jimmy Laws and you're diving for the try line every time, it must be pretty frustrating for you know a Bradford fan back in the day when it wasn't coming off. Or if you're a Rob Burrows running from dummy half, those are the things that get noticed, I think, from a number nine. Whereas you defended in the middle, you need a, a solid defender from, from a number nine. From what you're saying, I think from what I said to Matt the other night, we're basically we're, we're probably agreeing the the two of us that we've got Powell and Lula Y as the interchange hookers. Yeah, I'm really excited about Josh Ganson as well. I think you know hopefully he'll get a few get a few chances because th- that's a player who can score tries from number nine. He's proved that like you know the lower levels, but he proved it last year as well. He he came in and grabbed a try, didn't he? Was it the league game he grabbed a try? Yeah, I mean. I, I sort of I feel like I'm the the biggest member of the Josh Ganson fan club, and it? it's a very small <laughs> uh, it's a small population at this moment in time, and I feel like I might go over the top a little bit. But I, I, I from watching the under 19s and again, you know, credit to Wigan TV for this because it allows us to perhaps watch a lot more of the 19s games than than, than than ever before, and and that's probably part of this reason. But I've never been as excited about a young player as I have about Josh Ganson, um, perhaps since, you know, Tompkins came through the system or, or even George Williams because Yeah. He's class. I mean, and there's there's no there's no doubt about that. I agree. Completely agree. I hope he gets a lot of chances and and, and we'll see how he goes off the bench. I think he'll be a big impact. Uh, big switch up to what Powell can do. Yeah, and and I think I mean, you know, we, we, I spoke to this with Mark the other night, and I think this is probably the difficult thing with the the emotional attachment that you know a lot of Wigan fans had to, towards Michael McAlor and le- letting a player go that has been such a big part of the the team over the past few years. But what it does is it allows a pathway for the likes of Josh Ganson, and I think that has probably probably pay, played part of the um, you know the decision making that that Sean Wayne's had to do. Um, I think we're right on the same page. I think everyone else listening will disagree with us, won't they? But we're yeah. I'm on the same page as you with that completely. And uh, you know, I think in it, uh, you know, I, I said this the other night, and uh, you know, whether you agree with this, uh, we'll we'll see. But letting Michael McLaurin go to another Super League club is disappointing. You know, overridingly, it's disappointing. You don't want to see him play for another Super League club. But once the dust settles, I think that's probably the right decision. And I think that's the the way that we're going to come about it. If we finish in the top four and Catalan finish in the bottom four, then who's going to be who's going to be questioning it come October? Well, I'll tell you who is questioning it. Matt from the other night. There you go. Josh <laughs> well, Johnson will get more point. chances if Sam Powell plays at half-back and Thomas Lulawai goes to nine. So where does Morgan Escaray go, Matt? 
You know, an- answer that on the comments. Who, who do we drop? Well, that's, do we drop that's Morgan Escaray? When we talk about when we talk about defence, Morgan Escaray was an absolute shambolic defender in when he was at Catalan, from what I could see. Um, and then for us last year, that was the biggest part of his game that improved. Everyone talked about maybe in attack, but he didn't score that many tries. He scored about three, I think, that I can remember off the top of my head. And his goal yeah, kicking was, was abysmal. Yeah, his goal kicking was awful. I mean, everyone <laughs> moaned about Matty Smith, but Matty Smith goal kicked at, you know, 75% or so for Wigan, whereas Escray was kicking at 60%, less than 60%. It was, it was awful. So the best thing he brought to his game that I didn't expect was defence. So I think, you know, you can't, suggest that these players aren't going to improve defensively in our structures. Here we go then. Matt's reply to you, Mark. If Morgan can fit in Tommy's pocket, then he can whip him out as and when needed. It's a pretty good way. So we're going to play with 18 men, according to Matt, rather than rather than 17 men. Um, we'll move on to... Thanks, Matt, for your, uh, <laughs> for your input. I feel like Matt may be on commission for how many games Sam Powell gets at seven next year. That might be uh, that might be what uh, what Matt's getting. I think at. it's a, there's a chance, isn't there, for that to happen? Yeah, I, I we'll think, see I what happens. Injuries chance. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. You got to, again. You got to remember Sam Powell came through the system as, as a six and seven. You know, he, he is a halfback that's been made into a into a number nine. We'll, we'll move on from. He the, had a great um, game against Witness, didn't he? Do you remember when we used to play all the kids on the plas- plastic pitch when and him and Lewis Tierney? Oh, had that great game, and then he, he scored the drop goal to win it. In that, yeah, so he, he yeah, has played is... well at six in Super League in the past. He has, but to be honest with you, no disrespect to Witness, but me and you might be all right at six and seven against Witness some of the time. You know, who knows? Well, um, but yeah, that, that was definitely that. That was Lewis T in his first game. I remember the you know the Sky camera showed about sixty minutes of action and twenty minutes of Jason Robinson sat in the crowd. They were more amazed at Jason <laughs> Robinson watching his son than they were at the game. We'll we'll move on from 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 that because I think the next time Mark that we probably speak or whoever we, we speak to on here, you know, the squad numbers are probably going to be a big indication. And I've never yeah, seen. Of you know, that is, at this moment in time, one of the things that's making me laugh quite a lot about us as Wigan fans. We seem to be getting caught up about the fact that we haven't released squad numbers yet, which on the base of it seems ridiculous. But I can understand where some well, people... Well, Castleford haven't from. either. Castleford I didn't know, haven't either. Catalan only released theirs last week and uh, Hull KR only released theirs last Friday. But apparently, we're the only club that's a joke and an embarrassment because we haven't released our squad numbers. I, I'm, I'm baffled by it. We do, we do like a good meltdown, and and the one yeah. thing about Wigan fans is we like to have announcements about announcements. I think that's the uh, that's that's one of the sort of running jokes about us as Wigan fans at this well, moment. I, I time, haven't got but... my season ticket yet, and I'm really feeling like I need it when the first game at home's in like what six weeks. I don't think I'm, <laughs> I don't think it's it's not burning a hole in my wallet. Not <laughs> <laughs> you need that piece of plastic for March, but you need it in January. Yeah. Right, let's 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 move on. Uh, one sort of question that I, I posed to you uh, this morning, Mark, and and I'm sure you've had time to think about it, and you've probably had time to think about it over a very long, close season since the uh, since the World Cup final. And um, top four predictions for this year. Yeah, um, I have been thinking about this actually. Saints are, are nailed on, aren't they? Um, to, to go into there, there. They seem to have got things sorted in the second half of last season and they can go into this season with a bit of stability of a, of a pre-season together with the new players and not much turnover from them, but they made the big splash signing towards the end of last season. Um, yeah. So so I think they'll be in there. I, I genuinely think we'll be in the top four. Uh, maybe I'm just one of those optimistic fans who, who sees the best and, and all that, but I genuinely think we'll be in the top four. I think the other two places, um, Hull FC could be really good or could kind of be a bit underwhelming and they've just lost to Hull KR in the pre-season derby but that doesn't tell us much the um it's 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 going to be interesting for them how they deal with the Sydney trip like we've got to deal with I think whoever wins that game is going to really be set up well for the season um and I'm going to say we're going to win that game and uh and they're not and then they're going to have to deal with how they replace the leadership so I think them and Leeds have got a big question over who's going to be the leaders in that team. And, and one of those two will make it, but not both. And then one of Castle or Warrington will make it. And it really, for me, depends then on the spine of those two teams. Like we're talking about the spine of our team. At Cass, they've got to replace one of the best three players in the league last year. 
uh, at fullback. Yeah. And it's how they're going to do that's a question. And then at Warrington, the, it's the biggest turnover of any squad, really. That is certainly a squad that's going to be competing. But they've brought in some decent players. So so one of those two will be in. If I had to stick my neck out, I'd probably go Saints, Wigan, Wire and Hull to be the top four. Okay. I think the point that you make about um, Castleford is interesting in terms of there's this there's always this second season syndrome, and we're not talking about second season of Castleford ever existing or 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 winning any. They only won the league league this year, but don't don't say that to any Castleford fan because they won Super League fun to Castleford fans. Um, but it's it's this difficulty of being a very good team, and, and that's exactly what Castleford were last year, and then coming into this season, um, being you know a team to beat, you know. You look through the fixtures now and you're looking at Castleford at home, you're looking at Castleford away as a game that you desperately want to to win. And it's this thing, sort of using an analogy of football that Manchester United had to deal with a lot during the, the 90s and the early noughties of being, they are the team to beat almost, although they only won the league leader shield. I think that's going to be a difficult thing for you. It, good point about um, Warrington. I think Warrington have had such a big turnover, like you say, players, but the players that they've brought in on paper are, class they, they really are um they are but they want tyrone roberts to run a game from the halfback positions and last season he ended up playing most of the season at fullback and i've seen him playing you know hooker or various positions and i've never really seen him control the game from halfback so that's that's a big question mark if he goes well in that position they're going to be top four if he doesn't yeah. i don't know where they're going to be and i think one thing that we probably saw with Warrington last year was, was the signing of Kevin Brown and how Kevin Brown is probably a halfback that needs a certain type of halfback with him to to you to play well and we probably saw that with with England as well um during the World Cup so it, it's that Roberts Brown sort of partnership nobody knows how that's going to go you've got a new coach um uh, Warrington as well nobody knows who how he's going to go He's obviously been brought in from from the NRL after a pretty sort of unsuccessful, I guess, experience of being a head coach down in in the NRL. But he'll naturally bring new ideas. Wigan missed out on the top four last year. Cherry and white tinted glasses saying that we're finishing the top four. Do you think, or, or do you think heart, hand on heart, that we are a top four side? Well, look at our, look at look at what the bookies think. They think we're a top four side. Look at if we go back, you know, twelve months all Wigan fans thought we were going to win everything. We looked yeah. at our squad and we said we're going to win everything. And do we really think McLaurin and Gellin going and Sargentson coming in is going to stop us from being... As... We're we're basing this on how disappointed we were with how we played last year, but yeah. we're not necessarily going to be the same side. We're not necessarily... You know, we're still going to have some great players in our side. It's about someone taking ownership of that side. If no one really does... Um, from the halfback positions, then yeah, we're probably going to struggle again. But if someone takes hold of that from the halfback position, the problem last year, they, they say it wasn't scoring tries. Well, it it, it wasn't because we scored a lot of tries, but all our tries came out wide and we didn't have a goal kicker. So we've tried to address that with a goal kicking coach. Yeah. Um, to, to be honest, if anyone kicks at 75% for our side, we'll be scoring way enough points to win most more, most game two thirds of the games we play in that gets you in the top four. That that's the way I see it. Yeah, but yeah, it is a bit hopeful. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it seems daft ask, asking that question, doesn't it? You know, like you say, this time last year, if I would have asked that question, you know, between ourselves, are we going to top four side? It's like, are we going to top two side? But now, did we finish six last year? I think we finished six after that Wakefield debacle. Six, but well, yeah, we'd given up. We'd thrown like that game was. Everyone was done, weren't they? The, you could see there was no real attitude to play in that game, which isn't a good thing. You don't want to no. see a team go out like that. But, but let's face it, this is a team that's used to be in, in the grand final. They've played four grand finals. It, it's, a different, it's a different kettle of fish for them to, you know, to be in that kind of situation. They haven't been in that situation since, well, only a lockers have been in that situation, basically. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. I just put a comment on the screen there from, from Matthew Brown, who's watching... Uh, I wouldn't wish injuries on any team. However, top four finishes will depend on which club or clubs have an injury crisis in 2018. We've seen how Leeds in 2016, Warrington 2017 and Wigan in 2017 have been affected by injuries and how this contributed to the final standing. I think that's a really good point, uh, Matthew. Thank you for uh, for getting involved. 
It is, and Hull are a team that have got a relatively thin squad. If you look at their best 19 players, really good. But if they have to go into their best 25 players, they ain't got as good a best 25 players as, as Wigan, as Warrington, as Saints, I don't think. Yeah, and that's, that's trying to predict the unpredictable, isn't it, with with injuries and, and you know, I think we're going to have done a, a lot of work over the past couple of years to see why they've had so many injuries in 2016 and 17. And I think when you listen to the, uh, the interviews with Sean Wayne, the conclusion was, we don't know. Um, so they've got a new physio, um, I think Matt O'Malley from, uh, from sort of part way through last year, which might, you know, give a new take on things. But it, it is luck, you know, there, there's, there's no doubt about it. I do think we're going to finish in the top four. Um, you know, I, I can't imagine we're going to not finish in the top four, and it doesn't bear thinking about the other three teams that I think will be up there. I think Saint Helens on paper, it, it kills me to say it, but yes, they look very good, uh, and and I hate the fact that Saint Helens look very good on paper. Um, I think Castleford might struggle with this, what I'm sort of classing as second season, season syndrome. And I think the point that you made about trying to replace Sack you know, th- that that's not going to be easy. I think a lot no. of people are going to target Luke Gale this year as well um, to, to not allow him to maybe have the freedom and, and the run of the game that, that he had last year. So I'm going, what am I going for? I'm going for Wigan will be in there, Saints will be in there, Leeds. And then I think it'll be between Warrington and Hull. Um, as I think the points that you're making, one of those could go really well, but it could go the other way. With the, perhaps a lack of um, depth in in the squad at FC might might come back to haunt them at some point. But again, on paper, do we think there's any shout? Do we think there's any shout of Wakefield making a run? You know, like they they, well, they, beat, they finished above us last year, and they were only a couple of points out of the playoffs last year. It probably seems a bit disrespectful of us, doesn't it? Not mentioning them. Yeah. Um, they probably deserve our respect uh, in that regards. But, um, I mean, no, is my honest answer. <laughs> I, I, just, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not going to try and make a case for them. I'm sorry to any Wakefield fans that might come across this video, but they've recruited well over the past few years. And I think Chris Chester has shown at Hull KR and at Wakefield that at times he can be a very, very good coach in terms of producing an attacking team. Um, but I think the wheels came off a little bit at Hull KR um, just before he left. I'm not saying that'll happen this year, but... Um, well, no John Keir alongside no, him. That's no John Keir. Yourself. Yeah, John Keir, obviously, at Bradford um, this year. And I think that you know possibly might tell... He might prove us wrong, but no, I'm not classing Wakefield as a top four side <laughs> for, for this year. This is a question that I mentioned to you just... Uh, before we went on air, and I didn't mention it to you this morning, um, bottom four predictions. It's not something I'd thought about, to be honest with you, but... Um, Witness and Salford, four... they're, they're done. Yeah, Salford. No, no hope for Salford. I, d- I don't see... I don't see the, the, they've just not brought in enough quality in the, in the squad. Um, uh, their outside backs look probably the weakest group of outside backs, those two sides in, yeah. the, in the competition. So I don't think scoring tries is going to be Come, come that great for them um, so those two I, I put down at the bottom uh, I think it's going to be a more difficult year than a lot of Hull KR fans are expecting for the Robins I don't yeah. I just can't I look at their squad and I think Danny Maguire at 35 is he really good enough to turn what is basically a squad that comprises of half the team that went down and half a team that's never played in Super League yeah I, so I think they're going to be down there. And the other one I think will just slip out of contention is Huddersfield, just because I like the look of Catalan's recruitment over Huddersfield's recruitment, which is basically no recruitment again for the second year running for Huddersfield. So I'd, I, and I think Kudjo's going to be an injury cloud. And if they lose anyone else in that back line, then they'll think, they'll struggle. So I, that's my bottom four. I, I, do you know I think... I hadn't thought about it before I asked you the question, to be honest with you. I was, I was going to go off uh, <laughs> what, what you said and, and sort of think about what you said. And I think it makes perfect sense. I think I think you nailed on with Witness, Solfers and probably Hulk KR. I think Danny Maguire works very... I mean, that, the, the performance from Danny Maguire in the grand final was, was ridiculous. Absolutely incredible to, to produce that against Castleford like he did. And, and I, I don't like him as a player. And it kills me to say that Danny Maguire was fantastic in that grand final but he, he absolutely was um 
But I think it's a good point about Huddersfield. I, I, I almost feel sorry for them a little bit with the lack of recruitment. I think they've done well to keep hold of Jermaine McGilver here, but uh, when your best player well, he scored is... scored 25 last year and it didn't help, did it? No, he when your best player is a winger. Wimper, other than against yeah. us, because we couldn't beat him. Yeah, I mean, the uh, when your best player is a winger, I think you... Pr- uh, no disrespect to any wingers, but I think when your best player is a winger rather than uh, rather than anybody else, you're probably in for, for a tough time. I think we're both agreed on that. I think that's a nice, short conversation about the bottom yeah. four. Probably both completely wrong uh, after when we approached July and the uh, the eight split off. That's that's the better thing. That's I mean I know we'll be losing the eights next year. That's almost nailed on. But that's been the best thing about the eight system. Before that, I pretty much predicted where teams were going to finish for three years in a row in Super League, and was like one team out every year of being perfect. And then since yeah. the eights have come in, totally different kettle of fish. It is. I mean, who would have thought Catalans last year with the recruitment that they made at the start of last season to be in the million pound game? I mean, you know, but at the same time, away in the million pound game. Yeah, away because they struggled so much in the eights. Again, this is probably a topic for for another conversation and another night because we could go on about this forever. But that's the beauty, I think, of the middle eights. But also the problem is we were within eighty minutes of losing. One of the strongest, and I use a term franchise lightly in rugby league, but one of the strongest franchises within uh, Super League um, over the past ten years. You know, we we were in real danger of losing them. Yeah, yeah. Um, but like I said, that, that's a conversation that we could <laughs> fill a lot of time with. So moving on from from bottom four, anybody getting promoted? Anybody getting relegated? Well, you have to look at what Lee have done. I mean, they've signed NRL players, not just. NRL players that weren't playing either, you know, they've, they've done better recruitment than Salford and Huddersfield and and a few other play, clubs like that. So if they can get everything to work with all the different players, I mean, it's a huge squad turnover for a third year in a row. But if they yeah. can get everything to work, you have to think that they're in a shout. And then, you know, there's, there's the Wolfpack who are a full-time ent- entity as well. So you got to look at that. Um, Toulouse aren't going to get promoted, but I think they're going to be a team to watch next year because they're going to have... Um, Ford and Bartow was their halfbacks, and Bartow was the best number seven in in the championship last year, I'd say, at uh, London. And Ford was brilliant until he got injured playing for the Cook Islands, and then that basically derailed to lose his season last year. They were finishing in the top two, if that, or top three, if that didn't happen. So, so they they should be fun. It should be a fun division, the championship in the middle eights. Um, it'll be a shame that it might be the last middle eights because it it should be a, a cracker with eight full time teams this time is what I would expect to see, and that'll be good. Yeah, I think the competition in the middle eights next year, you know, this coming year in 2018, if it was to continue, you could imagine, you know, maybe say till 2020 with the, you know, inclusion of whoever comes in, New York, whoever, you know, teams that are going to recruit well, you could see the middle eights becoming one hell of a competition in a few years' time. But it just, you know, for whatever reason and, and for many reasons, really, it just doesn't work yeah. a lot of the time. Like I said, it's time. Yeah, and I, another time. Yeah, and I think so. Do do you think anybody will? You obviously said you know Lee looked good. Toronto will yeah, definitely I think look Witness, good. I think Witness will get overtaken by one of those sides, at least yeah. one of those sides. So I think at least one of Lee or Toronto will get promoted. I mean, I think one of the one of the things that frustrates me about the middle eights, and I think one thing that Toronto are probably in a position to take advantage of more than other sides, is this recruitment that happens just before the middle eights. Now Toronto have got an excellent side as it is and you know they'll be in the top four of the championship anyway. But you can just imagine Toronto just investing a little bit more money just around July time uh, and sort of strengthening their squad to ensure they get into Super League for twenty nineteen. Well, Beaumont's not afraid to do the same, is he? So, no. so there's going to be two sides doing that. And Witness are afraid to do the same. They haven't done any kind of, you know, they're taking punts on a couple of guys from PNG and and stuff like that. But they're not they're not breaking the bank to bring in a halfback, which is what they needed to do after Brown went last year. You, you know, yeah. last year maybe it happened so late that they couldn't find anyone. But they've had all season to find someone, and they've not found someone to come in and go alongside Joe Miller. So, yeah. I, you know, you don't see them improving, so that's their own fault. Everyone's, it's a, you know, everyone's got the same uh, playing field to, to go off in terms of transfer deadlines and and stuff like that. It's the, a question popped up about will there definitely be promotion and relegation? Yeah. Um, that's the thing about 
what I don't know is any if any team will actually go down. <laughs> um, because yeah, we might that point. get away that the 12 owners vote for a system that's going to have the 12 owners still be in Super League owners. It's just a couple of other teams might join them and those teams might be the teams that prove themselves best in the in the middle eights, or it might be the teams that are the most commercially viable to make that step up. So, so that'll be interesting to see. I, I think there'll be promotion, but I don't think there'll be relegation. Um, but after the year, Sky apparently, this is a rumour, isn't it, that Sky is saying there's no... There's no like there's no new TV deal that doesn't involve promotion and relegation. They like the idea of the Jeopardy games at the end of the season, creating all the conversation and viewing figures for the MPGs have been good. So yeah, why get uh, rid of it? Yeah, and whatever makes money uh, is going to be of interest to, uh, to to Sky and the sponsors from that. I mean, I think again, this is uh, this is a whole different um, you know, conversation topic because we could go on for hours about this about yeah, maybe we're drawn into it, aren't we? Super League Two. You know that's been thrown out there about having two upper tier leagues where you maybe have a crossover, a bit like you know the eastern and western sides of, of the NFL. Um, it's probably something, but I mean the thing with rugby league is the fact that we're having this conversation on the fourteenth of January and the season starts in three weeks and we don't know, like Matt, you know, like you just said, and, and Matt makes a point there on the comment is, does, will anybody get relegated? That for me, some yeah, rugby league up in, in a nutshell is who gets yeah. right, who gets relegated. We don't know on the fourteenth of January will, whether that will actually happen this season. Um, but yeah, I think you know, thank, thanks, uh, Matt, again for for that. Um, I think that could be could be uh, something that just doesn't happen this year. Now, one question that I did ask of Mark uh, this morning as well was the the question that I think every person that writes a blog or has a fan site and probably yourself mark will be asking this question on the podcast it's one of the ones on our predictions uh form so yeah there is a we've listed the favorites uh, according to i think the bet bet fred's odds uh we've listed the favorites for the award and then people can pick their other choices if they're if they're out there a lot of people have sort of jumped in for john bateman from the from the others list but ben barber's the favorite and okay. uh he's getting the most votes as well at the moment on our predictions form but i have a feeling it might be roby or barber because i do think saints are going to be the most consistent and compelling side throughout the majority of the season um fingers crossed for us beating them in the grand final that's 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 how i feel it might go. But, yeah but, um but I, uh, I think James. I hope James Roby gets it because so many people kind of put a shadow over his winning back in two thousand and seven because Barrett, yeah. he was an interchange player. But for me, he's been the best hooker in the competition for ten, twelve years, and uh, like an undisputed thing. Then, then you can't get Wigan fans who want to hate him just because he's a Saints player saying that that he doesn't deserve it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think going back to that 2007 season when he when he became uh, the Man of Steel, the, that was the last year in which the vote. That was the year that the voting system then changed. After that, maybe yeah. it had that as a direct consequence because there was this feeling of Trent Barrett had this incredible season for Wigan and, and basically he was Man of Steel, um, and James Roby sort of came in as this interchange player and, and, and picked it up. Uh, and obviously, the voting system changed after that. John Bateman was, I think, when I did the interviews with a lot of people uh, last year, notably a lot of lot of Wigan fans. John Bateman was the favourite last year. Uh, obviously, missed yeah. the first four months of the season, and, and that obviously did his did his chances, uh, you know, a lot of damage as well as the season that Wigan went on to have. Uh, I mean, you've got so we've got, we're going Roby Barber as as two of the favourites. Do you think there's any other contenders in there, maybe from the other clubs? A player that I think is going to have a bounce back year is Daryl Clark at Warrington. I think he was better than people realised last year. Um, and if they're going to be a top side this year, uh, I certainly think he's exciting enough. We talked about hookers who don't look exciting. Well, he makes 10 metres a carry out of dummy half and brushes yeah. people aside and has the pace to get, a, you know, pace to run away from wingers. So, and he defends really well. So he, he could be in, in with a shout as well from, from the other sides. And, um, yeah, I don't really think there's going to be anyone standing up enough um, from some of the other sides. I think at Cass, I don't think it'll be around one player at, this year. At, at Leeds, I just don't think the voting tends to go the way of overseas players these days. So yeah. Parcel and um, it'd be Parcel or Cuthbertson would be their sort of standouts, wouldn't it? I don't, I don't see that 
being the case. So I, I like the idea of Bateman. I like the idea of a sentimental one for O'Loughlin as well, if he can, uh, you that, know, that, play sixty minutes a game and and see a full season yeah. through and retire on on top. Um, I, I, part of me wanted him to lift the World Cup and then retire then and yeah, there in a weird yeah. way. Even though as a Wigan fan, I don't want to lose him, but yeah. you know, I want to see him retire on top. So that's that's a good way for him to go out on top. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, my my pick for Man of Steel this year is exactly that, Sean O'Loughlin. I think it's it's that sentimental vote, absolutely, and it's the biased vote because I'm a Wigan fan and, and you know I'm running a program called Wigan Fan TV. But for me, Sean and my name's Sean. Um, but yeah, Sean O'Loughlin has to be for me. He's my tip for for Man of Steel this year. He is, like you say, he's going to play what seventy percent of games and he's going to play sixty get sixty minutes. But he'll be there for the finals if we get there. That's what you'd hope to see. Yeah, I mean, where, on o, on O'Loughlin, um, we're pretty lucky at Wigan to have had this long run of loose forwards, pretty much since me or you would have been born, really, since the since the mid mid eighties yeah. of just world class loose forwards. And I, I, I think sometimes O'Loughlin's not looked at in the same way as people like Farrell or people like Hanley. And I don't think that's necessarily fair. I, I think he's is is every bit. A world class player who, when it, once he's gone, we're all going to remember him forever for like particularly the last six, seven years of his captaincy. But even before that, I, I don't know. I just love him. <laughs> no, I, I I completely completely agree with you, Mark. I think one of the things that I have an overriding memory of Sean O'Loughlin was being this person that was thrust into a captaincy too uh, too young an age and struggled with the captaincy because he wasn't a vocal leader, and that's what we were used to in the form of Andy Farrell. You know, we were used to seeing Andy Farrell behind the sticks after Wigan had conceded a try, going mad at the players. And then all of a sudden, you change this to be this young kid, and he was at the time Sean O'Loughlin as your captain, and he was more, he was meant to be a leader that did it on the pitch rather than did it with his voice. And I think he's grown into being that vocal leader now. But he had to find that. And I think, you know, going maybe back to two or three topics here, but I, I think that's the point that we were making perhaps with. George Williams and Sam Tompkins as halfbacks is Sam Tompkins has that leadership, has that voice. George Williams has the yeah. skill, but he doesn't have that leadership yet. And I think that's one of the biggest frustrations that Wayne Bennett has or has uh, with George Williams, and perhaps why he got overlooks at different points during the World Cup was his lack of Oh yeah, of if he had that, he'd be the best halfback in the world. Yeah, I mean, it can't be that hard well, to talk, surely. Aside from Thurston. <laughs> Yeah, well, okay. The, the the best. He certainly would be the best best English half. But I, know, exactly. I think, you know, I mean, he, you know, he is a fantastic talent. But I think that is the one aspect of his game that probably, you know, George Williams acknowledges is his is his weak side. But you look at somebody. The point that I guess that I'm trying to make is, you look at somebody like Sean O'Loughlin. I don't remember him being that vocal leader back in 2003, 2004, 2005, whatever it might be when he first when when Farrell left. Um, yeah, so fact. it was 2006 his first year, his first year as captain, and that was like obviously a horrible, horrible year. Yeah, not not a bad, not a, not a great experience really as a youngster captain in the biggest rugby league sides in the world and nearly getting relegated. So yeah, maybe he was mentally scarred for a few years. But then you know the the, the last quarter of that year was was great experience for him, you know, because that was when. The DW was bouncing, or the JJB as it was back then. You know, we had fifteen thousand on every week for yeah, two months of the year. That was something else, was. and we had no chance of winning it out. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, when we signed Michael Dobson, broke the salary cap, and survived uh, relegation. Uh, but that—that that is, you know, I think what many people will go back to uh, and look back at the success between you know, 2010 and you know, hopefully 2018, 2019. That is probably the catalyst for a lot of the success that we had because. Players, particularly Sean O'Loughlin, Joel Tompkins coming through at the time, um, they had to go through Hanson that kind was of in the team. Yeah, so, um, but yeah, Man of Steel, my vote for Man of Steel, my tip for Man of Steel is going to be Sean O'Loughlin. I'm going to ask you to pick, although you've said Barber or Roby, are you going for Roby? I'm going for Roby, yeah. Okay, so then. You know, you mentioned team. Williams. Yeah. Williams is about fifth fifth favourite or something with the bookies and we didn't even talk about him being a potential Man of Steel that's, no, that's remember, strange isn't it it is strange but I remember talking about him a lot last year of when I, when I had this these conversations pro- probably written conversations more, more than in person on the blog uh, the two people that a lot of people p- picked for Man of Steel at the time was Bateman and Williams and Williams in March was probably everybody's Man of Steel 
you know, yeah, it was up, like up him, him and Gale were just basically trading blows for who was the best player in the league until yeah. the end of March time. Yeah, you're right. Uh, until he signed a new deal, uh, but never mind. Uh, he got his money, but uh, if if George he made Williams, as many assists after he signed his new deal as he made he, before he signed he, his he, new deal, he, <laughs> and he was the top assist maker in the Super League at all. George, if you ever watch this, I'm sorry, I do like you. You're a fantastic player, and I didn't mean any offence by that. The the last bit of uh, <laughs> the, the bit of groveling there. Uh, the last bit to to wrap up, I guess uh, tonight, Mark. Um, very generic sort of topic. Thoughts and hopes of 2018. First of all, from from a Wigan point of view, 2017 will be the year. I think that we'll always remember as being a disappointing year, but we're the world club champions, which seems bizarre. The fact that. 2017 will still be thought of in in that sort of regard of being disappointing. We were we were a yard forward pass away from having a kick to win the Challenge Cup final as well, or a yeah. strange video refereeing decision away from having a kick to win the Challenge Cup. You know, it it was a sh- it was horrible year. It was awful watching the games, and that's why we think of it as so bad as as well as the sixth place finish. Yeah, because that that. Well, that great win at the start of the season when we were playing exciting rugby in the first month of the season as well, and the halfbacks were actually playing together, and it was a different, it was a world away from August um, yeah. and September. But yeah, that's why it was so bad last year because we didn't enjoy watching it, did we? By by the end, no. no. So, so I want to enjoy watching it. <laughs> so, uh, and does this come back to this? You know, you, you read the, the the Wigan fans forums and you read your comments on Twitter and things like that. Do, what was the problem? You know, well, the question of what was wrong in 2017 is too broad a question. If 2018 we want more exciting rugby, you said earlier on, you know, we scored enough tries. It was just the fact probably that we didn't make the most of those tries in terms of turning fours into sixes. Do we need this new sort of brand of attacking rugby that we all seem to desire? Yes and no. Um, what is the other brand of attacking rugby? We play a structured pattern we just played it badly last year because we got we've got away from having players in motion if you think back to 2012 2013 which were you know Maguire's last year and Wayne's first year they were our best best attacking years since the early 2000s when we had you know Radlinski and um Renner from people you know (laughs) and different kind of kettle of fish and Adrian Lamb and people um in that, but in that 2012 2013 period, we had people in motion all the time, just like Castleford had last year, and that was great because people were running around and making people think twice. We've gone out to this one out rugby, and that's one of the most worrying things about losing Gellin. He was one of the few players we had who could beat his man one on one, just like yeah. John Bateman's a player who can beat his man one on one, just like um, you know, Williams is a player who can beat his well man one on one. We don't have enough of that, so we need to bring back some of that players in motion they're a lot more exciting because you might get the odd break down the middle of the pitch and breaks down the middle of the pitch tend to excite you a bit more than a winger running fast because we expect a winger to find some space and run fast yeah so maybe that's what we need to do make more breaks down the middle of the pitch uh, then you'd be more entertained that, that that's what i hope to see is more more entertainment ac- across the board i don't you know hull were painfully boring to watch for most of their games because they just kicked it and yeah. Uh, I didn't enjoy watching Saints for the first half of the season. I didn't enjoy watching a lot of the sides. So across the whole of the league, as well as just Wigan, I want to just be excited a, a little bit more. I think that's a, that's a very interesting point that you made about the, the sort of one-out rugby. And I don't think I think there's as fans watching the game, you know, and, and that's all what we are. We're fans. We're not we're not experts. We're not Sean Wayne. We're not coaches. We're not players. Is this this desire to have this sort of free flowing attacking? Rugby that I don't think necessarily egg, one exists or did exist, and I think the point that you make go back to 2012, where we probably had the best attacking season that I think we're going to probably had in in the Super League era. But we won the league leader shield, and I think that was it. You know, and and, and that yeah. was it. You know, we got we got beat by Leeds in the playoffs. We got beat in the uh, Challenge Cup semi. Was it? I think we got beat by Leeds in the semi final of the Challenge Cup as well. But we were playing this free flow. Oh, that was rugby. horrible. That was where Danny Maguire knocked it on, and then was that that year when Danny Maguire knocked it on? Obviously, yet yeah, they gave a try. 
he knocked he knocked he knocked it on in the grand final a couple of years ago as well. He's got a good tendency for doing that. I can't re- <laughs> I can't remember, but I haven't got over those. They deserve like said, that one though. They didn't deserve that semi final. <laughs> yeah, um, but the, 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 this is the point. Is I guess what I'm trying to make is sometimes we've got to be be careful what we wish for. Do you want a successful team or do you want an attacking team? I don't think well, this you overall can be both. team. You can, but I don't think our expectations line up with. What with reality is what I'm trying to say. For most what we people. want though is we want a forward who can run over everyone. Yeah. But then we want to be able to pass the ball out wide quickly and slickly. You, you can't have those two things all the time working together. And people people criticise we're going to say like the style of play is boring because it's maybe one out, but it's it's not that it's one man runs because we very rarely run it first man from the rook. We we pass the ball wide. It's just we've gone away from giving those players receiving the ball options so that defenders have to ask answer questions. That's what we've gone away from. So now you're wanting a one man to beat a man, but he's had three passes to get to that man. It's just then that man's on an island and on his own against two defenders, and that's where it becomes boring. So maybe a little bit just of mixing it up a little bit more around the rock will will make things more exciting too. Uh, there, there was a spell we went through during the middle of last season where we started – Running the forwards, particularly New Asala, sort of across the back of the rook, and, yeah, back in, and we never yeah. do that. We never yeah. swap the back, swap around the back of the rook. And actually, that was giving opportunities that we we stopped doing at all. So th- there's things like that that maybe are working into our game that we can figure out for next year. I think the the one thing that I've picked up on Mark in, in the past sort of 45 minutes that we've been talking is Sean Wayne has the most difficult job in the world. There's, me and you are two fans, and we're talking about our expectations for the league. Sean Wayne is a rugby league coach who's got to please not just two of us, multiply us by however many thousands of Wigan fans. We are the most difficult fans to please, and we are the least optimistic fans. So, a bit, you know, one thing that I think Matt was probably credited with um, on on Friday night was his enthusiasm. Uh, for the up and coming season, and I think that's probably the one thing that that 2018 I'd like to see one from myself and other Wigan fans is let let's be enthusiastic about the season. Let, let's enjoy the fact that we've got Sam Tompkins. Yeah. Let's enjoy the fact that we've oh. got George Williams. Yeah, that's work, Colin. Uh, let's enjoy the fact that we've got George Williams playing, Sam Tompkins playing, Thomas Lulawai on the bench, an international hooker that's going to play at hooker. Let's enjoy that. And I think that's my hope for 2018 rather than any specific, you know, I want to finish top. I want to win every single competition. Let's try and be enthusiastic. Yeah, we've got to stop kidding ourselves. We've yeah. got to stop kidding ourselves as fans that it should be perfect all the time. But then we've got then the coaching staff have got to stop kid, kidding themselves that we were that close to perfection last year because we weren't that close to perfection last year. So, so it's a bit, everyone's got to meet in the middle and just remember we're in it together and have a bit of fun along the way, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. And You're I, going I to have fun that... anyway in, in Australia, aren't you? That'll be that'll be a great trip. And I, I'm not going, but you are. I understand. Yeah, I'm. I'm going. I'm sort of re- very fortunate to, uh, to to be going, and and my wife at the time will be sort of four or five months pregnant. So that, that's uh, that's not gone down too well. But um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really I'm really looking forward to that. And and I'm, we've been in touch with a few people. There's a group uh, for anybody that's watching this. Uh, and is going on the New South Wales tour. There is a group on Facebook. Just search New South Wales Wigan Fan Tour or something along the lines, and you'll find it. There's a group on Facebook for people, and, and there's a real good community on there uh, in terms of people sort of swapping. And I'm really looking forward to it. Anybody that is going over to Sydney, I'll be over there filming uh, as well, and hopefully interviewing a few people over there. And you know, I think that's a very exciting opportunity um, that that Wigan have got as a club, and, and Hull have got as a club, and, and Leeds going to Melbourne. I think it will affect us throughout the season as, as we've picked up on. Um, but I think, yeah, my my overriding hope for 2018 is a bit of enthusiasm from from us fans because I think we probably give the fans we we give the players a hard time when they deserve it, but we probably give them a hard time when they don't deserve it at times and, <laughs> and perhaps don't appreciate them uh, as as how lucky perhaps we've been since 2010 as uh, as a rugby club. Mark, thank you so much for joining me tonight. It, it's been no fantastic. thanks for having me. It's been fantastic getting your insight. Like I said at the top of the show, Super League Pod, fantastic podcast to listen to throughout the year. Like I said, it's not just Wigan fans' points of view. It's pretty much every fan's point of view across Super League and beyond. 
Um, so you learn to look. like people who support other teams, and it's, uh, it's a bit possible. disconcerting at first, but but no, then it's, you grow into it after after three or four years. <laughs> no, that's that's not possible. That, that's why I've started Wigan Fan TV rather than like Super League <laughs> Fan TV or something. I can talk to people that have the same opinions as me rather than uh, rather than trying to sort of argue with or at people. least care about the same things. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. Um, so in, in terms of just wrapping up for, from tonight, check out Super League Pod. Please listen to to Mark and his team. They're, they're fantastic. Um, organization like us, we're not paid, we're just fans, we're not experts, we're just fans, we just put our opinions out there. Thank you, everybody, for, for watching tonight. Um, if this gets close to the 14,000 views on Facebook, like uh, Friday night's gone, then that'll be incredible. Uh, and I will be back on Tuesday evening. And, and I'm, fan- I'm really excited to announce that on, on Tuesday night, I'll be live on here at 7.30 uh, with Steve Mascord, who many of your noise say, um, is a well-respected um, Australian journalist that's based over in London who pr- pretty much, I think, has written for everything that's worth writing for, um, from the, the Sydney Morning Herald through to the Super League website. Uh, he is probably the one person, the biggest champion, I'd say, of International Rugby League that exists, particularly as an Australian. It's a very rare thing, I think, to find a, an Australian that is uh, very passionate about International Rugby League. I'll be talking to him mainly about his book. He's, he's got a book out called Touchstones, which um, is a book about him uh, going attempting to go to 52 rugby league games in 52 weeks and 52 rock concerts in 52 weeks, but it takes... I haven't read it yet and I've ordered it and it gets delivered tomorrow, but it, from reading the blurb, it takes a little bit of a different uh, sort of venture and a, a journey of self-discovery for Steve. Um, but one of the big things, I guess, as Wigan fans that I'll be tapping into, Steve is from Wollongong. Uh, he was a big Illawarra Steelers fan, and, and that's where Wigan will obviously be playing Hull at Wynn Stadium in Wollongong. So we'll be uh, tapping into his knowledge of that area and his expectations for Wigan and Hull fans going down to New South Wales in, in February. So I'll, I'll finish off again, Mark, by saying thank you so much for joining me, yep. and I'm sure people will see you again in the near future on here um so thanks a uh, thanks a lot and, and no, thank, thank you everybody for watching have a good night mark cheers thank you you too bye